we have members of the Ethics Commission with us. Why don't we go around the room and find out for sure who all's here. Oh, and Orca is still here. Contacting us on this one also. Okay. Would you want to sure, start? Sorry. Please back up to Vermont like it is I'm Tom Waldman. I'm the general counsel for the Department of Human Resources. All right, that's helpful. Jenny Crosser, Secretary of State's Office. <coughs> Suzanne Lewis, Ethics Commission. Sarah Vangel, Ethics Commission. Julie Holbert, Ethics Commission. Oh, oh. I'm Ann okay. Rask, Legislative Council. Now I'm the Chair of the Ethics Commission. Okay, um, I'm Alex Ayers, I'm from Shelter. She's shadowing me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm Brian Levin, the executive director of the Ethics Commission. And Denise? Uh, Denise Deal, <coughs> committee assistant. Okay, and the Welcome committee, Parker, so. Dennis? So I'm Representative Dennis Devra from Mount Holly, representing Ludlow, Mount Holly, and Shrewsbury. And this is Representative Patty Lewis, who will be back in a minute. And that's Berlin and Northfield. And you're Jim Harrison. I'm, oh, go ahead. Last I knew, I was yeah, Jim go, Harrison. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, and I'm Chittenden, Menden, Killington, and Bridgewater. And, and it's my birthday. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, happy, happy birthday. birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> we'll do lunch. <laughs> I'm, I'm Jessica Bremstead, and I'm from Shelburne and St. George, and Ella is here with me today. She's from Shelburne as well, and um, goes to Mount Christie and is hoping to be a page next year, so she's shadowing me. <laughs> Representative Marsh Gardner from Richmond, and welcome everyone. Nita Townsend from South Burlington. Rob McClure from Barrytown. I'm not participating participating in a German pool because it just wouldn't be fair. <laughs> <laughs> Cindy Weed, representing Enosburg and Montgomery. And John Gannon from Wilmington and Whitingham. Whitingham. Yes, Halifax. and, and Halifax. he's over um, oh. in appropriations, having to give testimony on one of our other bills. And I'm Warren Kitzmiller, representing Montpelier. And this empty chair is Tristan Tolino from Brattleboro. Who's part of the leadership. Yeah, he's almost uh, never here. Building and leadership. off doing nope. leadership type stuff. Just as well. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, state code of ethics. Who is it that we should be having talk to us first? Oh, I think Brian. 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 Okay. And do we have this electronically on our web page yes. now? Oh, yes. Good. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. He Dennis. It's, that's the handout, and I brought it up so everybody would oh, be ready. Oh, oh our Good IT job. specialist did this. Thank you very much. <laughs> it was 10 minutes ago I brought it up. So, <laughs> so, Brian, if you wouldn't mind. And, and Madeline as well. Oh, together. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah.
on ethics to primarily to draft this and um, to draft this general principles document. Um, and can I work if I could? Betsy, would you remind the committee what serves as the context for this? Sure. So uh, Betsy Andras, Legislative Council. Last year, the General Assembly enacted what became 2017 Act Number 79, which was your ethics bill. It established the Ethics Commission and uh, its duties. One of the duties in Act Number 79 was to create a state code of ethics. It's codified in 3 DSA 1202 for that the Ethics Commission has this duty. And I'll just read it. Uh, it's a one sentence statute. It's entitled State Code of Ethics. It provides that the Ethics Commission, in consultation with the Department of Human Resources, shall create and maintain a state code of ethics that sets forth general principles of governmental ethical conduct. Thank you, Benson. So uh, it, along those lines, too, I'd like to add that uh, we did receive some uh, some good comments from Tom Waldman at Department of Human Resources, um, I think many of which uh, make, make a lot of sense and uh, we'll, we'll look to incorporate in the next draft. Um, is it the committee's pleasure to walk through this section by section? I mean, it's not a lengthy document. Um, Why don't you walk us through Okay. Um, so again, this is State Code of Ethics. These are the general principles of governmental ethical conduct. There's really two sections to what we presented to you um, that's preceded by what we, we thought it would, would be important and helpful to have a mission statement, uh, some explanation of uh, what the Ethics Commission's responsible for to, as, as sort of a preamble to this. And then, um, and then we get into section one, which is the general principles um, you know, it's, it's, it's the heart of uh, what the commission is charged to come up with here. Uh, as Madeline indicated, we did look at a number of state ethics codes. Um, the, the structure here largely models that which you see in the Code of Federal Regulations. They have a, a specific section that's just the general principles. There, the, those are the overarching principles that then um, the rest of their code flows from. So this is essentially that. Um, many of those principles are embodied here. So if, if you'd like, we can just start walking through each of those. Um, you know, there's, a, there's an explanation to begin with about how public service is a public trust. Um, public officials are required to uphold the Constitution, the law, the state code of ethics, and, and also the governmental codes of conduct, the, the other codes that are out there, whether it's um, you know, personnel policies or attorney code of conduct, judicial code of conduct. These are codes of conduct um, that um, have ethical components to them. And, um, and that by public official here, we're talking about every elected or appointed officer or employee of the state. Um, uh, this, again, would only be state government. So we have 13 enumerated more specific general principles. Um, the first is the basic prohibition on having any personal or financial interest, um, whether it's direct or indirect. Um, a public official uh, shall not engage in uh, any business, employment, transaction, or professional activity or incur any obligation <coughs> that's in conflict with the performance of their duty. And as we um, have, have sort of explored and going through this. Is, this is the conflict of interest is, is a lot of what we're talking about when we're talking about ethical governmental conduct. So this is uh, there's a reason I think why this is the, the first principle enumerated here. Um, sorry, number two, a public official should not engage in financial tracts and transactions using information that they obtained in the course of the performance of their duties. Um, you know, they, um, you know, they might create an unfair advantage. Number three is a prohibition on the soliciting or receipt of any uh, a, a gift um, or anything of monetary value. Um, this is from any person or entity seeking official action from or doing business with 
or conducting ac activities that are re regulated by a state agency, um, or whose interests may be substantially affected by by their performance or, or non-performance of their duties. Brian, yes. uh, Rob, and Cindy have a question at this point. Sure. I'm sorry if I missed this. Does, does this apply to just state officials, or this is to elected folks as well? Like, Ele uh, elected, appointed, and employees. So I, I have a question on number three then. Mm -hmm. Let's let's say when I had this actually happen, with the exception of the morning, I had a business call me in that was concerned about a piece of legislation that's down here and say, hey, listen, this is really going to have a real major impact on, on us, on our ability to do business. And so we had the discussion, and they said, you know, when that time comes along, we're certainly going to look to encourage you to vote against that. And let's say that I, I do, because they're my constituent and they're trying to make some sense, and then they make a contribution to my campaign later on. It's, is there a, an issue here? Potentially an issue. I, I guess I'm not. Um, you know, th this is written. Uh, I think to address someone's doing business with a state agency. So you have. So, okay, so. Um, in the way it reads, it's you know. The prohibitions on soliciting. In, in this case, the official soliciting or, or accepting a, a gift. If that person's in front of you, you know your state agency, let's say you're on the Public Utilities Commission. Right. Um, so we do have specific statutes. There's prohibition on legislators receiving gifts while they're in session or receiving campaign contributions. Um, and any gifts, you know, you have to report, disclose. Um, so th there's nothing in these general principles that uh, expands upon or restricts the law in any way. I think this, the way this is written, and, and, and maybe we'll, we'll look at that when we uh, you know, consider how this might affect the legislators. Is this creating a, a different scenario than what we're talking about here? Or um, I, I know this language really, you know, the Code of Federal Regulations doesn't apply to Congress. You know, so um, they're they're just talking about executive branch state agencies. Um, so. so I, I understand your concern. I, I, I think it would be worth our while to, to just look at that again and make sure that you know we're, we're not saying something that goes beyond what the, the law already requires or prohibits. Thank you very much. Yeah. Got Cindy and then Justin. Well, it was along the same lines. I mean, we have a steady stream of receptions in here that we participate in from organizations that are basically lobbying us. Mm -hmm. And then it looks like it shouldn't happen by line number three. They're just feeding us. You mind there, if, yes, if you would identify yourself for the record. And then, yes, Sarah Vandal, I'm a uh, member of the Ethics Commission. I just I think these are all great points. I think, like Brian's, I agree with what Brian's saying that this is, you know, this is a first draft, and this certainly gives us food for thought about how this may be tweaked to apply to legislators. I think as it's written now, the timing of the gift makes a difference, right? I think the way that's written about solicit or accept, I, I would think you know, with the situation that, that you had presented, if if you had the meeting with the constituents and they say, if you vote this way, we will make the contribution, right? Mm -hmm. That might be more problematic than, you know, we'd love it if you would not, you know, not push this through and um, uh, and then and as a result they end up making a gift. But certainly, I mean, obviously it's. Mm -hmm. points for us to consider going Who, for. Be safe that if I didn't vote the way that they were looking for me to, I wouldn't get a contribution. Not that that would be sort yeah, of my yeah. <laughs> I just want to say, too, here's an example of how you need to flesh out these principles. Mm -hmm. and, and definitions do a little bit of that. But, you know, that's what a real ethics code does in terms of conflict of interest. It fleshes out these issues for the different people that it applies to. Mm -hmm. and, um, and also, that's you know, it's a perfect, you know, ethics advisory question that you would call our office about. And we could take the time to look up the laws that are applicable to your question and, and uh, respond, you know, accordingly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then Jessica, you know, I um, <clears throat> wondered about, well, first one thing about what Cindy said, the set, steady stream, they're all billed as meet and greet, so they're more of an opportunity to say hello, I think. Um, but number one, a public official shall not have 
any personal or financial interest, direct or indirect, or engage in any business. Thank you. I just number was, one. What number? Number one. one. I was just curious. We have member a lot of members that are have other jobs mm -hmm. as well because we can't afford often to do the whole thing. And um, some of those, um, for example, I, I'm on a board and my executive director of the board is a member of the legislature. Would he or she be in violation of number one? Because she definitely has a public, a personal and financial interest in that not-for-profit. Um, it's indirect and conflict then. And yeah, so I just wonder because there's so much of that here that that one is hard. I mean, I have to think. Again, it's a general principle. That's why we need definitions and to define it and make it more of a um, specific instances and activities. But um, I know in the federal government they have. Um, you know, they waive, they have a waiver process for, and they also have, you know, that you excuse yourself from any decision-making capacity. That would be the general way to handle that. And that would, if we had more of a code, we could put we that in the code. We have rules set in yeah. the back. Right. And right. I've only seen it used once, and I've asked a lot about it to myself, is should I be using that on this or that? Yeah. So, um, I don't think in the past it's been used very often, so this is going to be incredibly important in the education process and understanding whether or not we need to. Right. Yeah. And, and again, this is just establishing the principle that you, you shouldn't have any conflict. And if you do, and what you do about it, mm -hmm. then it's, it's just left to, you know, Rule 75 or, um, Whatever other enforcement may be out there. Press on. Yes. Press on. Number four is uh, this one is fairly mm -hmm. simple. A, a public official should not knowingly make unauthorized commitments of any kind that obligates state government in any manner. So this is again unauthorized. Um, number five. Uh, prohibition on using the public office for, for personal gain. And um, also, you know, the, the official can't have a, a potential or substantial interest which is in conflict with the proper discharge of their fiduciary duties. Sorry, I notice this little grammatical thing to go along with. It's only draft one. Right. <laughs> the next draft will be even better. Yeah. Um, Point six. Number six. It's a requirement that public officials act impartially. Um, they're not allowed to give preferential treatment to any private organization or individual in the course of state business. There is a caveat here that if it's not possible that the public official must recuse him or herself. Um, but again, this is just a general principle. So how the nuts and bolts of how it plays out is left to those policies and procedures that that are in place. Well, again, I, I guess I, I go back to like number three. I mean, my job down here isn't always to be impartial. In fact, quite often, that's what's expected of me is to, to advocate and to take a position. And I'm just curious to know, again, would that apply to, to us here? Um, whether you want to talk or you know, act with lobbyists or constituents or whatever, you don't always, you never have the chance of saying, you know, maybe it's either yes or no. Mm -hmm. Is that? It's, it's, a, it's a great point. You know, these, these principles are intended to be aspirational. So, um, you know, you know in, I think there's a distinction, even as a legislator, that you make between you know, having a personal stake in something and not being able to n neutrally make a, a decision um, versus, you know, your position on a public policy matter. I, okay, so this sort of falls under the purview of personal gain as opposed to just being more general. That, I, I believe so, yeah. Okay, and, and, okay. It's, and it, I appreciate your point, and I think we'll, we can 
pay a little more attention to this. Maybe that maybe there's a way to explain that even a little better. I would think on, on this point, the way I the way I would read that, if you act impartially, that means you come into a a discussion with an open mind. You listen to both sides mm -hmm. fairly, mm -hmm. and yeah, well, then we have to come down one side or the other. Mm -hmm. We have to vote yes or no on a particular mm -hmm. question, and that at that moment you are making a decision and acting in favor of one side or the other, but you come into it with an open, that's the way I view it. Is that reasonable? I, I think that's reasonable. Well, standard standard behavior, yeah. Yeah, okay. So, I think it's, it, in this I see it as you're giving, or you're not supposed to give uh, preferential treatment to any private organization or individual. That would mean you were doing work for somebody else. So I think that's pretty clear. It's not, yeah, we're all, we all have ideas and leanings, but if I'm just doing that for an individual or for some private organization, set it for the betterment of the whole, I think that's what it says, that's how I read it. Well, I'm extremely open-minded about most everything. Okay, <laughs> we'll note that. <laughs> I, Number seven. Yeah, actually, uh, if I may, I'd also point your attention to the definition section where conflict of interest is defined, mm -hmm. um, which does offer a little bit more towards uh, explaining this. And, and, and at the end of that, I don't know what I'm, what's behind me here, but on the, what appears on the top of page three, which is kind of the end of this definition of conflict of interest. Uh, conflict of interest does not arise in the case of votes or decisions on matters in which the public official has a personal or pecuniary interest in the outcome, such as an establishment of a tax rate that is no greater than that of other persons generally affected by the decision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's helpful if that's first, the definition. So when you start reading the info, mm -hmm. you've already read the definitions. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I see what you're saying. Yeah. That's how it is in, in law. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's how we do it, set it up. Yep. Yeah. And that definition tracks with what we're used to with regard to yeah. And it also tracks what's in state law, that, what, where conflict of interest is de defined, uh, I think, as it pertains to municipalities and, and mm -hmm. even in state government as well. So. All set folks to proceed? Yeah. Okay. So, set. Number seven is that a public official shall avoid any actions that create the perception of a potential or actual conflict of interest uh, with their official duties um, or that they're violating the law or a state code of conduct. Mm -hmm. You obviously see a lot of overlap here, but there's... Number eight, yes. Public official has to, is required to protect and conserve government property and resources and use their time and property only for official business. I hope this one's not controversial. No taking of pencils home. <laughs> or, or, or doing uh, un, unneeded un studies. Mm -hmm. <coughs> A public official shall not seek or negotiate in any manner employment that potentially or actually conflicts with his or her official government duties and responsibilities while in state service. Number 10, a public official shall be free to disclose to the Ethics Commission or other authorities. Um, this is essentially whistleblower. And, and in fact, this language uh, mirrors the statutory language that the legislature enacted, uh, which expresses the intent of the whistleblower chapter. Um, number 11 uh, requires a, a good faith compliance with the, uh, the public official's duties as a citizen, including tax obligations, uh, that's just by way of example. There are many others. Number 12, um, this is anti-discrimination requirement. Public officials shall adhere to all laws and regulations that mandate equal opportunity for uh, all these protected classes. And number 13, we've uh, struggled with the best way to present this one. Um, I'll read it. A conflict of interest of any public official shall be imputed to any public official appointee or employee who serves at the direction of, and control of that first public official. What the idea we're trying to capture here is that if, if someone has the ability to hire and fire 
someone underneath them. And that, that person, I'm sorry, the, the hirer or firer might have a conflict. The person below them has a conflict too because they, they really are serving at the direction and control of that superior that has a conflict. So you don't get out of having a conflict just because you have somebody working underneath you signing the contract or, um, you know. So it wouldn't work to say, I was just following orders. If, 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 it, if the person giving the directive mm. to do whatever well, in, a, in fact, I, I think that would have the opposite. I mean, it, it wouldn't work to say I don't have a conflict, mm -hmm. um, because which may be true, but the fact that your boss has a conflict, mm -hmm. we're saying as a matter of a general principle also. here, mm -hmm. that you now have a conflict also. So, and, for instance, you know, the governor has a code of um, a governmental ethics code for you know, conduct for their appointees versus appointees and employees, and that flows down, but it's not flowing up right now. And so this would be making sure that that he's also is captured by that that code that he's, uh, he says verbally he is, I mean, but that he's captured by the, his own code, for instance, or his own uh, conduct, uh, conduct policies and code. So we're just making sure that it's a two-way street. Jim has a question. Yeah, I'm not sure if this is really a question. I just, it, it hard to draw that line. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, let's suppose uh, Rob is my supervisor, and I have an employee that happens to be his ex-spouse, um, and is that and he, it wasn't a friendly um, divorce. Um, so um, I, I, I'm just using you as an example. I, I understand that. I, I, I love Joe Linda, and, uh, and, 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 and I know it was. <laughs> and they still get along. <laughs> they still get along. Do tell. But anyhow, um, obviously I'm going down the wrong path here, getting myself in trouble. Yeah. But, um, what? How do you handle situations like that? When I know, you know, my boss would probably love it if, but she's not a good employee, or he's not a good employee. I mean, whatever the case is, um, how do I defend myself? They're not doing their job without it appearing that there's a conflict because my boss had a conflict, potentially a personal conflict. Mm -hmm. I, I just, I, I don't know, it's hard to put it all down in writing and then have it solve every situation. Right. I, I, I sincerely agree with your last statement there. I'm trying to figure out your, your example here and how I could respond to it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it, it, it certainly is a challenge drafting these general overarching principles that, and you know, to, to stay general, um, you know, we, we, can't get into the weeds too much. Yeah, um, no, I, I but I'm. I'll have to think about your example a little more because I'm, I'm not and, and, and quite. And you can't tall. fix everything; uh, otherwise, you would do nothing. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I'm cognizant of that too. So I think, as a matter of a general principle, what we're saying you've got a conflict if your boss has a conflict. And, 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 and I, for and public I service, but but there could be other situations where you don't know your boss has a conflict, and you're just mm -hmm. going along doing mm -hmm. your job, mm -hmm. and maybe you entered in. A, let's forget the employee situation. Let's say you entered in a contract that, unbeknownst to you, is in conflict. You know your 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 boss might have mm -hmm. a conflict, mm -hmm. and you don't know that. Uh, you don't know that he's got an investment in that company. You just signed a contract. Um, now, am I guilty for doing that? Well, maybe I should have known, but I don't. It's not my business to ask my boss, you know, what have you invested in lately? Right. Well, I, I, I won't, won't deny that this maybe will encourage more diligence on the part of you know, some public officials to know what conflicts their bosses might have. Okay. Clear. It, again, we have no. Um, the legislature has not given us authority to investigate or 
in force. So these are aspirational. And that, you know, they're not even detailed enough to be a standard of conduct, but they're just a, right now a general principle. So. Okay, Jim? Yeah, I'm good. All right. Well, uh, I have a couple structural questions. We're dealing with another piece of legislation, and you folks have mm -hmm. used as an example. How often do you meet? We're on a, a once a month once schedule. A month. Once a month. Yeah. And have you found it that you needed to meet more often to sort of stand all this up and get all this worked out? Well, I can address that. We certainly, we certainly did. I mean, our timelines were really tight initially. Sure. I mean, our appointments came through in um, October mm -hmm. or September, mm -hmm. and we had to get a financial disclosure form out by January 1st. We had to, I mean, our timelines are really tight. So okay. we essentially, until we, we had to hire an executive director, which we did pretty fast. And mm -hmm. so um, this was our next, you know, deliverable. And uh, so we met, we met as much as we could meet, given that we're all over the state. To, and the committee has been a real working committee. I mean, everybody's taken pieces and, and done pieces, like right now, um, Julie is doing um, marketing. You know, we have to have a marketing plan. A lot of, we're getting complaints, and we haven't even marketed the program. Sure. I mean, we're getting complaints, and once we, we're out there, we'll probably be getting a lot more complaints. It would make sense you have to meet more. Oh, we and, do. And, and once you get the infrastructure in place that you're looking for, is the once a month going to continue? Is that enough too often? About right there, three years? I think, I think once a month will probably continue till the first year and until we get more funding. Okay, very good. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I, I will. I, I don't know if you want to walk through each of the definitions. Um, there, I'm, I'm happy to discuss any or answer any questions. Committee, any questions with regard to definitions? Marcia, so did you um, take the definitions from from the federal language or? We, we didn't for the definition section. Okay. Where did you take the language? Um, I think we identified certain terms that are in the general principles that we thought could use a little bit more explanation. And there, there, are, there are some terms that I think naturally fit in a, a code of ethics um, that need to be there even as we move forward. Um, so it, it's sort of a combination of those two things. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions with regard to the definitions? Um, at some point here, it would be helpful for us to know what suggestions have come from HR to fold into this. I don't know how you're thinking of proceeding. Is there more that you want to, to tell us about this document at this very moment? Well, I, I, I have a few things to say. I think um, you know, these are very broad uh, principles. We're going to be we're required by statute to do um, ethics trainings and ethics uh, advisory opinions. And based on these, it's, it's you know, it's pretty, it's going to be, we don't want to guesstimate when we give an answer. It's pretty slim pickings right now, given that they're general principles. Um, and again, um, so I think as we go forward, I see these general principles as almost like a preamble to further, uh, you know, development of the state ethics code. And again, at the core of the state ethics code, at the core of any state ethics code in any state is conflict of interest uh, issues, conflict of interest rules. And we'll be developing further the ethics code based on the queries we get about ethics concerns or ethics advisory questions. Um, we'll be looking, um, when we design a, a training, uh, ethics government ethics training curriculum, we're going to try to keep in mind what the subject, you know, questions about gifts, honorariums. I mean, you know, we got a call the other day about a question from the Office of Attorney General about an honorarium. And so, so that'll help us flesh out as we go forward with building the ethics code. Um, that'll help us flesh out the, 
the, uh, the definitions and help us flesh out the code. And so that is more meaningful in, in terms of actual anticipating these questions. Because you can imagine when we're doing a training, these probably half of the session is going to be on questions. Like, well, how does that apply to this, to my situation? And, and so if we can have those down, what, you know, how, that, how those applications would occur, that would be, you know, that's, I think that's where we're going. We see this as just a progression on, this is an it, that we're moving forward on developing more specific, helpful, practical uh, code. And we also remember the code, uh, COJO, which is um, the Council on Government Ethics uh, Laws, and that's every ethics commission in the state, they get together, and also in Canada, they, their Canadian counterpart, and they have a meeting, and all they do is talk about this, all they do is work on, on ethics issues, and a lot, most of them have, in, have investigative authority, most of them have enforcement, so they're already, they're, they're in a whole other plane than we are at this point, we're the, the youngsters in the group, but um, we, rec you know, they're a huge reference for us, and they've been very, I've reached out for, to probably about five different states, and they're very helpful in helping us, um, you know, giving us advice on, on what we're doing here. So it's like a lot of these, you know, we're not working blind here, you know, so. We've got questions from uh, Warren Kaminchik. Can mine, mine has to do with your view of what's, what's, what's your scope? Are you really only after state em employees and state officials, or will this at, at some time filter down to municipal level? Things would you would you see yourself as offering these guidelines to municipalities, perhaps, since they're aspirational in nature? And I, uh, I, I I came to that question. With definition thirteen of a public official means any state officer, whether elected or appointed, and is an employee of the state. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's that was taken off the table. I think when the bill was being drafted, that municipalities wouldn't be folded into the state ethics code, but we're certainly um, more than happy to assist them in, in developing conflict of interest rules or in terms of trainings. I mean, we're a resource. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Jim, and then Jessica. Yeah. Um, I mean, I totally agree that a lot of this is, as you get the questions, you develop the information, you respond to it. Uh, just like we're asking questions here. Um, but th having said that, there's a real value. I think 99% of public officials, if not 100%, go into it wanting to do the right thing mm -hmm. and just having information and trying to have an understanding. Um, and for example, uh, we're all, for the first time, going to be faced with filling out a new disclosure mm -hmm. form. And it's not necessarily black and white and easy to understand where certain things go. Um, you know, Brian and I had a conversation about how to, and, and it's new to Brian. Um, and so ultimately, um, I discussed it with the reporter of the bill. And, and, you know, so I think together we, for my own particular situation, I feel comfortable on doing it correct. That's all any mm -hmm. of us want to do, is do it correct. Right. And sometimes it's a little bit more complicated for mm -hmm. us folks that are, um, you know, perhaps not working full time mm -hmm. and we have um, other um, mm -hmm. retirement sources of income. So mm -hmm. um, I, I would just encourage you so that, you know, the candidate, you know, is filing um, this next month, you know, here's a Q&A on how to do it. Yeah, um, that's a good question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, it was asked yesterday by a House member, yeah. do we have a list of you know, FAQs, and I said, this is the first You're we've developing had it. We, we haven't had any frequency <laughs> yet. We had a deadline we're, we're to, questions. to actually do the form by January 1st, so we were just getting the form out. Yeah. And, and then the Secretary of State's office didn't leave enough space to actually, I mean, you can't even type in Social Security without running out of room mm -hmm. um, on, on sources. So it's, it's, uh, it's a learning. So, you know, we're doing the code, but some of our other deliverables are, we're doing internal policies. I mean, the, they don't exist, and how right. we handle complaints, and how we operate, and um, that's that's another thing. We're looking at monitor, complaint monitoring system, 
that's um, that can then track the complaint in anonymously and, and then you know uh, provide some data so that when we do our annual report um, we'll let you know that I I'll, I can say I don't think I'm disclosing anything but for the last month most of our complaints were about legislators <laughs> no, probably no, no. What did we create here? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, so, uh, and the complaints are coming in, but like I said, we don't even have any. You know, we haven't done um, anything in the news. You know, we we now, you know, we have to get a website. We have to get a hot, you know, a phone. We have to get all those. So we have those in place, and we're working on that. So, so what happens when you get a complaint? So you get a complaint, I'm required to give it a preliminary review to see if it's alleged a violation of right. law or code of conduct, and, and, uh, and the, the complainant's name's on it. And the only requirements are that it's got to identify the complainant, it's got to be in writing, and it's got to allege a violation of some sort. And okay. if, if it does that, then I refer it to the appropriate state agency. If it's a complaint about you, I'm going to send it to the House Ethics Panel. Okay. Um, if it's a complaint about a state attorney and send it to the professional conduct board. Do, do, do you um, uh, do any investigation like, um, you know, we got a complaint about you, um, what's your side of the story? No. No, so that, not that, allowed that to falls, do that. Okay. No, I, that we, falls we on like the enforcing agency. We're prepared to do that. We've got a ton of attorneys, you know, and, and you know, he's an attorney, I'm an attorney, we're prepared to do that. Mm -hmm. He's prepared to do that, but we don't have that authority. So we do a quick preliminary review and send okay. it on. So in the case of a House member, you would refer it to the House Ethics Committee, perhaps? Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. And if you need, you can always look back to the statute that we passed last session. Mm. All of this is, it's, it's, I'm not trying to be a no, no. smart aleck. It's all very clearly outlined as to what happens in each case. Okay. In the statute. Act what it became. Act what? 79. 79. 79. I'll forward it to the committee now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Jessica? And that was sort of my question what you had asked about the um, processes inside. Are you getting going with a website and all those things? It's hard. Those are, you have a lot on your plate to mm -hmm. get going. And um, earlier we were talking about municipalities, and yes, that you don't have to do that, but I did think that the Secretary of State was sending you any of their municipal, yes. right? That was part of the act. And mm -hmm. um, and then my other question, it, we're working on another bill that we have the Attorney General here talking about complaints due to elections yes. and the way things are happening and that those are going to be going over to you too. So my question to get to the question is, are you going to have a way, even today, from minute one, to start collecting the type <coughs> of concerns so that we can see, oh, this line, this group is much, it seems to be a big problem. This group seems tiny compared to the overall. So you're not losing sight of it as you're getting up to speed. Right, that was one of our, <coughs> that's one of our priorities. And, and I've been talking to different um, people about, um, providers about what systems they have in place to track complaints. I'd like to get a good system in place now rather than put it in later. And um, uh, there's a few. Uh, Congressman Welch uses an IQ system that we're looking <coughs> into. They're pretty expensive. Uh, I'm looking at Navex. I'm an ethics consultant in Canada uh, with federal government, and they use this other. So, I, you know, we're hoping to get something in place. And, but in the meantime, you know, we are tracking them. We have. Uh, we're keeping them in place because we, we are facing this, you know, um, report down the road. That, and so absolutely. And that will, you know, the complaints and the types of complaints will drive our curriculum. It will drive how we proceed with the um, building the ethics code further. That's what I sort of hoped, so that's really nice to hear. And um, one of the things that concerns me is that today our, the Attorney General's office staff from there came and told us that in 10 years, they've had these 10 complaints, which is hard for me to believe. I'm sure that there are a whole bunch of complaints that have come in that they just haven't thought were needed to be addressed. And right. so hopefully in 10 years, even those complaints will know something about so that it will help us to think through next steps in legislation and be better prepared 
knowing history. So I appreciate all you're doing, and you can only imagine how immense the project is. Well, we need more money, and we need more stuff. We're on a hundred thousand dollar budget. Yeah, yeah, it's very limited. Um, but I know I think there was uh, some discussion about an ombudsman position placed in the. Um, um, I don't know where it was where a that brief discussion. Yeah, and a brief it one. Was removed from the bill. Okay, I thought the Senate put it back. But okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the bill has not yet come back to us. Okay. Uh, I suspect that will be a major bone of discussion, oh, okay. contentions, discussion, whatever, uh, if, if it's back yet. If I did the research on that, and like 25% of ethics commissions nationally have an ombudsman person just handles campaign finance complaints and information referral in the ethics commission, and other bigger states have their own, they have a whole division for it. So. Um, we will be, you know, as we gear up, he's part time, and we will be taking complaints and uh, around campaign finance. So going forward, we're, you know, we thought it would be a good idea to include that. We did not dismiss out of hand the concept of ombudsman. It was a matter of practicality. Where are we supposed to come up with the money? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Impossible. Mm -hmm. Yes. I just I'll wanted to follow up on one thing that. Uh, Representative Brumstead's question. Um, you know, there's a requirement that the Attorney General's office regularly notify us on, camp, uh, on campaign finance violations, and there's a requirement that the Secretary of State's office notify us about you know, municipal complaints and forward those to us. Um, we, when we receive a complaint, if it's if there's nowhere to refer it to, we still track it. We, you know, we, we still have a record of it. But if other state agencies receive things and they don't tell us, then we don't know about it. Yeah. So okay. there are those two requirements out there for the AG's office and Secretary of State's, but I'm sure there are other complaints that come into state government yeah. and we may not know about them without an affirmative duty on behalf of all agencies to actually report that yeah. to us. So I, we suspect coming going forward that we may get sexual harassment complaints and, and making that connection, you know, I've already made that connection with um, sexual harassment uh, group about you know we're here we're going to be getting some so you should you know the, the worst case scenario would would be for us to say well we're sorry we can't handle we can't take that complaint that we should be on the list that uh, accept those complaints and I, I don't know if that got changed or not but I made that suggestion we are also probably will be meeting with the Human Rights Commission because they may be getting complaints and I don't know what they do with them and, mm -hmm. and directing them to us so. is it time for us to hear what uh, HR has identified as we need to be considered. Are you folks okay with our shifting gears a little bit? Okay. Um, Tom, if you wouldn't mind sure. just taking the chair so that we know. And what's the time frame that you folks are looking at for draft two? July. July. July 1st is when we're supposed to have one in place. Understanding that if there's a need to. <coughs> Yes. Good morning. For the record, I'm Tom Waldman. I'm the general counsel of the Department of Human Resources. Um, uh, the uh, Act 79 requires the Ethics Commission to interface with the Department of Human Resources on a couple of matters, one being uh, the code of ethics, the state code of ethics. And in that regard, um, the executive director did send me the draft and I've given him comments. Um, and you know, I, I think that uh, based on what he said, it looks as though my comments, the comments on behalf of the Department of Human Resources will be worked into the document. I don't, I don't think they're reflected in, in the version that we have up on the screen. Um, many of them were stylistic. A couple of them were substantive, and I'm sure that, um, that Brian and I will, will discuss it. Um, the other area where the department has a role under the statute that creates, that, that creates the commission is in um, the training aspect. Uh, the statute says that the ethics commission is to collaborate with the Department of Human Resources um, with respect to the ethics training, and we look forward uh, to working with the ethics commission when the time comes. Um, to do that. 
really nothing else. Committee, questions? Questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, would any of the members of the Ethics Commission want to share any thoughts with the committee? I want to make sure that since we have access to you <laughs> right here in the room, that if you have anything you want to tell us from your perspective, please. Why don't you take oh. it? Sure. It's just a, just a minor thing. Uh, Suzanne Lowenson, Ethics Commission member. Uh, I just want to assure the members of the committee that all the questions that you have, I think, have uh, occurred in other states. And so that's why we've, um, we've looked to neighboring states and states across the country to look at their codes of ethics. They're frequently asked questions, their, uh, their, their guidance, their training. And so we feel like we don't have to reinvent the wheel. So I, I believe a lot of the questions um, can be answered already in other places. Uh, we looked at something this morning just from another municipal or uh, government, state government that had a plain language uh, code of ethics, and so that was very nice in terms of some of the questions that people just just ask minor questions um, have already been addressed. And so those are things that we can't do everything right now. And so I think our first draft actually was more um, advanced in terms of having a lot of detail and maybe too much. And so it's just because. I think the, the detail is what helps people to interpret. So uh, we, are, we are using all the resources across the country that we can. So. One moment, please. Oh, <laughs> 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 I'm new to this. It's okay. Committee, any questions? Well, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else want to? Yes. Yes. Okay. Just briefly, Sarah Vangel again, a me member of the commission. Just at, um, I echo what Suzanne said and to thank you all for having us and it's nice to be able to even just report to you about what we've been doing. We have been very busy setting up the commission and trying to set it up in a way that we can provide good guidance and assistance to everyone moving forward. And I think what we've sort of all said, but just to say again, and I think your questions, Representative Harrison, were very uh, directed to that point where what we've presented with these general principles are just that, general principles, right, to get <laughs> everyone thinking about their conduct, everyone in state government is, you know, I'm doing that test. Is what I'm doing, is it motivated by personal gain? Is it motivated by the good of my constituents? What is my motive here? And that I think that having some, ideally going down the road, if we're able to develop more specific standards that address those specific situations that come up over time, that's something that we would really look to do and be interested in, in being able to provide. Uh, maybe the members could talk a little bit about their background, their jobs, oh, what, what they bring to the commission. Sure, sure. Um, so I'm an attorney. I practice in southern Vermont. Uh, Kramer and Vangels, a small firm. We do a lot of general practice work. Um, I do a lot of real estate transactions and I do a lot of criminal defense work. <laughs> so I think what I bring is a very varied perspective on a lot of different situations. Um, I was appointed by Chief Justice Ryber to the commission. Um, and I think, you know, my background as an attorney and, and certainly dealing with ethics as an attorney um, is really what, what I bring. What area in Southern Vermont? Brattleboro. I practice in Brattleboro. Yep. And I grew up in Vermont, born and raised. I was a page here when I was in eighth grade, so it's a nice sort of full circle to be here. And, and I don't know and, and if you came, came back. lady who's visiting Jessica yeah. to be a page. I did hear that. I hope that she does it. It was great, great experience. Thank you. If we could hear from the other members, if you want to hear from the commission also. Dick, you can stay right there as far as you don't have to get in the chair, I don't think. Well, I don't mind getting in the chair. Yeah, I'm going to get out of the chair. Everybody else has Okay, to okay, <laughs> okay. This chair is higher up, actually. Um, oh, well, I <laughs> well, I meant to fix it yesterday. Guys, <laughs> Carolyn was pretty tall. Um, I'm Julia. I'm from the town of Colchester. I was appointed by the Vermont Human Resources Association. I've been in human resources for about 18 years, um, the last 10 of which were in municipalities. So your comments and questions about municipalities, I'm, I'm hearing from sort of two, two veins. Um, and, uh, you know, I would thank the commission for their, uh, their support and the questions that you ask. The more questions that you ask, the more we can sort of address that as we define things in code. Um, and I hope that you'll all encourage you all are encouraged and will encourage your peers to ask questions because that is a confidential process and that will help us further define training. So I would be, I would be remiss as an HR person if I didn't say that we're looking forward to doing training 
And knowing what the questions are will help us define what that training will be. Committee, any questions? No? Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. And we're going to back. Um, I'm an accounting professor at UVM, and um, my background, I was on the uh, Daniels Ethics um, Commission at, uh, at Colorado State University when, uh, before, before moving here, and I've done um, research in, in, um, in ethics and ethics education, so that's my ethics background. Would be, and, I, and I'm a prior auditor, too, so I guess that um, it helps with a little bit of the details. Thank you. And you want to hear the background of our chair and ED? Yeah, also. definitely Brian. No. <laughs> <laughs> a stranger. Well, Madeline's no stranger to this committee either. Yeah. She lived in here when we were working yes. on the ethics committee. But she was a refresher. Yes, since 2014, actually, when it first started. Um, I have a um, law degree and I have a PhD in fiduciary law that I got from McGill. And so I have a real strong Canadian connection, and I'm a ethics consultant. I worked for, for Health Canada on their ethics board, and been working with academic uh, research university in, in Canada on developing their ethics uh, program for their professors and for their um, staff. And so I come from a pretty strong um, ethics background academically, practically and helping one of the things I do is help them set up infrastructures for ethics programs um, in universities and, and, and agencies. Um, I come from the um, the notion that ethics informs the law and law doesn't inform the inform ethics. And that we set a higher standard, we set a higher bar to aspire to. And we don't wait for the law to uh, get us there because it'll take forever. So uh, I'm forward thinking in, um, in everything I think about when it comes to ethics and how I think about ethics. I'm very happy, very pleased with uh, our commission members that came forward to, for the appointment. And then, uh, we've got a great group. We're missing one member, Chris Davis. He's a, an attorney out of uh, Burlington, and he was on the um, Judicial, Judicial Conduct, conduct uh, mm -hmm. Board for for, for a few years, and he has a uh, very, you know, he's, he's, the, he's, the, he's the more, not conservative, but the more voice of reason in our group, and I'm <laughs> sorry he's not here today, but he, so it's a great group, and it's, and, you know, I mean, Brian is, is, um, is, is great, and so it's, you know, we're working it, and so, you know, given the limitations we have, I think you know, we, have, we have a good ethics commission here. Thank you, and Ryan? Not everybody on the committee knows your history. No. Talk about the music. Thank you, okay, Dennis. talk about the music. <laughs> and, and, and Chris Davis was appointed by the BBA, uh, yeah. the, the fifth commissioner. Um, so yeah, I, I'm the executive director. I, I also have a small private practice as an attorney at Stowe, where I live. Um, I grow saffron. The, the crocus flowers that saffron come from. Uh, but that, that's very that's dear. Yes. Uh, but uh, prior to going to private practice, I was a deputy secretary of state for four years under Jim Condos for his first two terms. And before that, I was 12 years uh, in, I was Betsy. <laughs> <laughs> I left legislative council. Uh, yeah, I, I, I shaved my beard and grew long hair. No. <laughs> and uh, Betsy took over for me. So uh, that was 12 years in this committee and the, the Senate GovOps Committee and Legislative Committee on Administrative Rules. And, and he knows a lot about municipal government, helped us through a lot of charters. And uh, one of the ones that came here, Brian, is about the setting July 1st, the odor of marijuana in municipalities. Mm. And I'll do my best. Yeah, look into that a little bit. <laughs> Someone ordinances in place. So you can complain about your neighbor. It's still on the wall, I see. Uh, well, it's high on my list, but obviously not going very far. And so I wanted to ask also if Jenny had anything that we needed to hear from the Secretary of State's perspective at this point. Not at this point, yeah. Okay. And Betsy, from your perspective? No, nope, thank you. Our drafter, par excellence. Anyway, okay, I guess we're good. Committee, are we? Okay. Thank you.
So you have an extra 15 minutes for lunch or however long you stop before you have to visit with the Senate. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Thank and we look forward to the next draft. Yeah. We'll be here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We may well be here July 1st. Yeah.